Hello, everyone. I'm Stefan Lafortune of the Electrical and Computer Engineering Division of the EECS Department. And today, our guest is my former colleague, Professor Pramod Kargalikar, who is currently the Vice Chancellor for Research at UC Irvine, where he is also a Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science. Pramod was at the University of Michigan from 1989 to 2001, where he served as Chair of EECS. He received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Bombay and his master's in mathematics and PhD in electrical engineering, both from the University of Florida. Professor Karganikar is an expert in control and systems theory, cyber physical systems, and in particular applications to renewable energy and smart grids. He has received numerous very prestigious awards and professional distinction in his, uh, in his career, too many to mention today, but I will note that uh, Pramod served as Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation for the Engineering Directorate. Most recently, he co-led the chapter on climate change mitigation and adaptation for the roadmap called Control for Societal Scale Challenges, created by a large group in the Control System Society of the IEEE. Joining me today in this conversation with Pramod are Lydia Fraz and Mark Barron, who are undergraduate students in the College of Engineering with an interest in sustainability. Pramod, we thank you for taking the time to talk to us today and to share your insights on decarbonization, which is the main focus of our course, but also on adaptation and resilience as the world is facing the effects of climate change. So I will start with a first general question, and I know you have prepared several slides uh, in a presentation for us. So basically, tell us what your current thinking is about the challenges that we are facing as the world is aiming to get to net zero emissions within the next 25 years or so. Thank you, Stefan, and thank you, colleagues, for inviting me to this uh, uh, work that we are doing at Michigan. It's very exciting. And I'm very, very glad to be part of it. Uh, as uh, Stefan mentioned, I used to be on the faculty of EECS department uh, in the 90s. And so it's, it's a special pleasure to be, to be here and sharing my, my thoughts. What I've done is to put together a few slides, Stefan, and I'll just walk through them. Feel free to ask me questions. Uh, and then at the end, also, we can have a discussion after, after I'm done. It's, it's not very long. Uh, so slide one uh, shows the title of what I want to talk about, which is climate change, adaptation, and resilience. But in the background, you see a picture. And some of you may recognize that's the skyline of Detroit. And this picture is taken from earlier in the summer, maybe a couple of months ago, uh, where all the smoke from Canadian uh, wildfires was heading east and had blanketed Detroit. Some of you probably remember having lived through that. And a lot of my talk is really about this picture that you see in front of you. And hopefully the rest of my slides will make that very clear. Next slide. So in this slide, what I show is what's already happened. And on the left-hand side, there is a chart that shows what's happened to global surface temperature. Uh, going back to 1850, you know, sort of dawn of uh, industrialization, and the uh, temperatures hover around the, the baseline for, for a very long time. Uh, and that's why it's fluctuations around that zero. And then beginning around 1960, 1970, you see a beginning of a trend. Until then, you don't see a trend. But then you begin to see a trend. And it's inexorable. So yeah, there are fluctuations. It goes up and down. But there is a clear trend that now has brought us uh, to where we are. And we are approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius above uh, the baseline from 1850 to 1900. Uh, now, this is the mean temperature. Uh, there are a lot of variations within the mean. So mean uh, distributed across the entire planet has a lot more variation than the mean would indicate. Uh, it's the warmest multi-century period in more than 10,000 years. Uh, there is enormous evidence that shows that uh, this increase is happening because of 
human activity. So on the right hand side, you see uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, so greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide for the most part, but also includes methane, nitrous oxide, uh, and uh, and other uh, greenhouse uh, warming gases. And again, uh, right from the start of industri uh, industrialization, which was based heavily on use of fossil fuels, namely coal first, then oil, then natural gas, there's been just a steady increase of amount of CO2 we are putting into the atmosphere. And that's what is causing the greenhouse effect, which was known hundred more than 100 years ago. So there's no, no new real physics here. This physics was known way back in 1900, uh, roughly. And so we are now just sort of realize, seeing the effect of what we have been doing for the last uh, 150 odd years. Uh, next slide. So what may happen? So this has already happened. There is just no question about it. We are about 1.1 degrees Celsius above uh, the baseline. Uh, these, are, these are some charts, again, taken from IPCC, their uh, last review, which uh, finished in 2023. So these are extremely recent uh, conclusions from uh, UN IPCC. And essentially, I want you to focus on a few things on this chart. On this chart, you will see this implemented policies. So this assumes that the policies that are currently in effect will be implemented out up to, 20, uh, up to 2100. If that happens, we are looking at anywhere from 2.2 to 3.5 degrees Celsius global warming. Okay, So if you just implement the current policy, this is what we are going to be in for with uh, uh, sort of estimate of being 3.2 degrees Celsius is absolutely catastrophic. Now, uh, in the under the UN uh, nationally determined contribution framework that was behind the Paris Agreement in 2015, all every country has said, okay, this is what we can do to mitigate uh, climate change. Uh, you are going to see somewhere in, in this range of about two degrees plus. There is a big gap between the na what na nations have uh, committed to and what's happening and what needs to happen to get to below two degrees Celsius and then to get to below one and a half degrees Celsius, which is really where we want to limit it to. So ideally, if you want to limit to one and a half degrees Celsius, maybe it will go up to two, but then we want it to come back to one and a half. It is clear by now that what is required to go down below one and a half or, or limit to two degrees is extremely steep, deep, rapid and sustained reductions in greenhouse gases, okay? So that departs pretty dramatically from implemented policies and even from the nationally determined contributions. So, you know, it depends on whether you want to be an optimist or a pessimist. Uh, my conclusion is that substantial global warming is going to occur. What that substantial is, is remains to be decided, but 2.2 degrees, 2.7 degrees, 2 degrees, we are going to fall somewhere in the, in the mid, to, mid twos is what I'm thinking. Uh, hopefully, it's going to be better than that. Now, you told me, uh, Stefan, that your course is going to talk about decarbonization, which is great because that's all going to be about how rapidly we can bring down this emissions curve. And so I'm actually not going to talk much more about this unless in Q&A we want to get into it. What I'm going to talk about is climate change is already here and we can't wait. We can't wait. We need to deal with it as it exists. And if some of the more pessimistic scenarios play out, even in the most optimistic scenario, you are sure they're looking at one and a half, maybe 1.9, maybe two. This is going to have major, major impact. So what I'm going to talk about today is the picture I showed you in my slide one, which is our uh, our atmosphere filled with wildfire emissions. Okay, that's an example. Next slide. Uh, this is to set terminology a little bit, just because of these terms get used and people don't fully understand what they're talking about. This is taken from um, uh, the IPCC approach to these terms of mitigation and adaptation. So the, on the left uh, top, you see human interference, uh, which is causing the climate change, including the variability in climate. 
And that leads to exposure, exposure to events like wild, wildfires. Um, it will have some impacts. Uh, those impacts uh, could be increased temperature or droughts. And I'm going to show you lots of impacts in the next few slides. So let me not talk too much about impacts here. And how much impact, what will happen depends upon how vulnerable you are. So vulnerability determines what will happen to a given individual or a given community or a given city or a given nation. So that's the vulnerability. They together determine what happens. Of course, people will adapt nations will adapt, communities will adapt to these changes that will lead to residual net impacts. All of that is adaptation. And that's governed by policy responses. That adaptation changes how what happens to communities and people. At the same time, mitigation will keep happening. Uh, the, the focus of your course, which is to cut down on, on emissions will continue to happen. And this loop will continue for the next every single year up to the next uh, you know, 70, 80, 100 years. Okay? This thing is going to go on. Now in this chart, which is slide five, uh, I show impacts of change. And I want you to focus on, on the left-hand side, three boxes. One box is water availability and food production. This is going to be one major area of impact, is what happens to availability of water which will vary from region to region, like Great, Great Lakes are in good shape. You've got a lot of fresh water in Great Lakes. Uh, and and you know, maybe we will rely even more and more on, on uh, production of food from Great Lakes. But some other parts like California or some of the tropical regions, I mean, there could be major droughts leading to problems in food production. So water availability, food production is one major bucket. Second major bucket is cities, settlements, and infrastructure. You know, so here I wanted to think about flooding, uh, think about uh, hurricanes, uh, uh, wildfires, damage to infrastructure, damage to key economic sectors. Some people may not have jobs anymore because whatever they were employed in, that occupation doesn't exist because that you can have economic activity is no longer viable. So that's the kind of thing that you can imagine happening to cities communities, settlements, infrastructure like grids and transportation networks and so forth. The third box I wanted to pay attention to is health and well-being. Uh, so if you think about uh, extreme heat, which we saw two, three years ago in Northwest United States, in Seattle and uh, Chicago and, and so forth, um, 10, 15, two, three weeks of extremely hot every day, extremely hot temperature, old people dying, uh, so, so, so you're gonna have uh, extreme heat, malnutrition, wildfires, mental health impacts, uh, infectious diseases uh, are likely to rise as well. I mean, uh, so all of that is gonna impact health of people uh, and it will have differential impacts. Older people may be at more risk, infants may be at more at risk, young people may be not as much, at, you know, may, may be not as vulnerable. Then there is a fourth bucket, which so the, all these three are human systems. Okay, these three are human systems. The fourth one, which is biodiversity and ecosystems, is more natural systems. So you're, you're thinking about terrestrial ecosystem. Here I wanted to think about animals and plants and so forth. We have lost so many species that it's you know it's astronomical. Uh, but you have freshwater systems, think like rivers and lakes, and then ocean. Oceans are a big, big part of this picture. Uh, and they will also change as a result of global warming. And that will lead to, for example, fisheries and production of, uh, of seafood uh, and so forth. Now, uh, at the bottom of this chart, you will see uh, the underlying processes. What are the physical climate processes that are leading to these human level impacts? First is droughts. So agricultural and ecological droughts. Increase in fire weather, which we are, are already seeing. Increase in compound flooding. So different flooding uh, impacts, uh, hurricanes leading to rivers rising and so forth. Uh, and increase in heavy pre precipitation, which is uh, hurricanes, uh, major storms. Uh, glacier retreat uh, as the polar regions are melting uh, and global sea level rise. So these are going to impact low-lying countries, for example, Bangladesh or Fiji. Uh, some of the, the Pacific na uh, island nations are in tremendous 
travel. They could just, you know, essentially people could just disappear. And, and they are, I think, the, far, uh, the front edges of, uh, of impacts. Uh, upper ocean acid, acidification increase in hot, hot extremes. So I kind of made a list of most salient things that we need to worry about, increase in hot extreme, increase in heavy precipitation, increase in wildfires, increase in droughts, ocean acidification and sea level rise. So these are the things that will happen and people will respond to them, adapt to them and be vulnerable to them. So to me, adaptation and resilience is crucial as we think about our future. Next slide. Here yes, I kind of lay down. Uh, do you mind if I ask a question? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, please interrupt. Um, so could you explain a little bit about uh, upper ocean acidification, um, what it means and uh, how that could damage the ocean? Well, I think what it will do, uh, you know, so oceans, if they become more acidic, uh, among other things, uh, it mm -hmm. will impact uh, ocean species. Mm -hmm. Essentially think of fishery, fish uh, communities in the ocean, and they will be at greater risk uh, in terms of uh, their existence. So that I think is the main risk we are. So as we acidify more, you know, the, uh, these uh, fish won't be able to breathe and things of that nature. That's what yeah. we have in mind. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Thank you. So uh, in, the, in the next slide, I show uh, kind of describe adaptation and resilience. These are two terms I'm going to use. So adaptation is the process of adjustment to actual or expected climate and its effects. Every nation now is thinking about adaptation, like how are we going to adapt? And this varies from place to place, nation to nation, region to region. Like California adaptation is going to be different from Michigan adaptation. It's going to be different from New York or Florida or Bangladesh or, in, or India or Africa. In human systems, adaptation seeks to moderate or avoid harm and exploit beneficial opportunities. Like I said, you know, maybe some parts of Midwest and upper Midwest and Canada could become more temperate and could become even bigger food producers. So that's a beneficial opportunity that climate change offers. But again, that's just a, just a hypo hypothetical that I'm posing in front of you. Mm -hmm. In some natural systems, human intervention may facilitate adjustment to cli expected climate and its effects, like in ecological systems and river systems and so forth. Uh, resilience is a little different thing. And I think for engineers, it's really an important thing to think about. Here, the idea is this changing climate is going to lead to more frequent and more intense extreme events. And the thing to, to keep in mind is uh, two examples to keep in mind. One is hurricanes, other is wildfires. So these are actual events. They happen, uh, like we just went through an, uh, a, an unusual hurricane in, in California, but in Florida, new hurricanes are coming up. We are going to have more of those and have more intensity. And these are events that will last for a few days and then they will go. But we are going to have to deal with uh, those events and recover from those events. So the resilience refers to capacity of social, economic, and environmental systems to cope with a hazardous event, trend or disturbance, responding or reorganizing in ways that maintain their essential function, identity, and structure. So what's an example? Imagine your power grid, okay? Uh, you're in Florida or Puerto Rico, you get hit by a hurricane. How many days are you going to be without power? And how long will it take for the power to be brought back up? The longer it is, the more the, more the harm to people is. So can we work on uh, power system infrastructure, which is more resilient to hurricanes? You can do the same thing with, with wildfires. You can do this with droughts. You, so you can think about different events and what are you going, what can you do to make yourself more resilient so that we can survive these events and come back uh, from these events. So resilience is a positive attribute of a system when it maintains capacity for adaptation, learning, and transformation. So Pramod, would you say that engineers play a crucial role in the resilience aspect? So I think, I think engineers have a role in almost every piece of this puzzle. So I want engineers, especially your students, Stefan, to have a broad view because we bring a certain mindset, uh, problem-solving mindset, a way of thinking about things, a way of thinking about systems, uh, Stefan. So 
I would not leave adaptation out of it. For example, you know, one of the adaptations we're going to have to make is, can we come up with agricultural systems that uh, use less water, okay? Or use less natural resources, less fertilizers. And I think that's a perfectly fine problem for engineers to be working on. Now that's adaptation, not so much resilience. Okay. So yeah, I, I think it's a good question. Clearly in resilience, especially of technological infrastructure, power grids, water systems, uh, gas lines, uh, transportation networks, front and center engineering issues, but agriculture systems uh, and so forth. I think, I think we should be thinking about those. Thank you. Yeah. And then I have a quick question for you. So yeah, sure. as you're kind of discussing adaptation and resilience, yeah. what direct advice would you give to students on the topic of like, what they can do kind of right now in their lives, other than sure. like, you know, going into the different fields, but like as a student right now, what types of ways can I aid in different adaptation and resilience efforts? So I think there are many things you can do. First thing is I would start to connect with local communities, okay? So I'll give you some examples from California where I am. Uh, so we have a number of projects here where our uh, faculty and students are working with communities. Uh, some communities are nearby, uh, like low-income communities near uh, UC Irvine. So we are in a very rich part of California, but 20 miles away are very kind of, you know, disadvantaged commu Hispanic communities. So those colleagues are going and talking to those people and saying, okay, you know, uh, what, how, what can we work on in terms of extreme heat, which is a big risk for us? is extreme heat and old people at risk. So uh, that's an example, but I think each each region has its own community. So I think if I was a student and if you had, maybe you have some student clubs or something, uh, beginning to make connections with say Detroit communities or, you know, Ypsilanti communities or, uh, or other parts of Michigan, uh, which may be local to you to understand how they are going to think about impacts of, climate change uh, on, on Michigan, right? And those communities, I would, that would be like the first thing I would begin to do. Second thing is I would begin to educate myself more on everything that I just talked about. I just give you a very high level view of what's coming, uh, but I think just becoming more aware of like, one thing I've noticed say for engineering students, it's not natural for us to think about public health impacts. You know, we, we think, uh, we think, I mean, I don't know what engineer, you, what, what you are studying, but we, we, it's not very common for us to think about like, okay, you know, what are the public health impacts? Uh, so uh, take this, uh, the recent Canadian wildfires, right? The air quality was terrible. People with, with breathing problems, asthma, uh, I mean, they were in, they were seriously impacted, right? So are there like low cost devices that can help those people cope with that kind of air quality problem? So once you, once you sort of begin to engage, the number of problems and opportunities just limitless. Like there are so many things that you can be thinking about uh, as an engineer uh, by discovering uh, people's problems. And that's what I would advise. If you're a today's student, educate yourself, and begin to connect, begin to connect with colleagues, uh, with our students from other departments, other schools, other colleges beyond engineering. Like Michigan, one of the great things about University of Michigan that I'm very proud of is every college is so excellent, right? So you've got the great College of Public Health, you, you've got uh, College of Medicine, you've got Arts and Science, I mean, you've got everything. So, uh, and, and great social work, right? Institute for Social Research, ISR is one of the best in the world. I bet, I bet they have deep connections to uh, what's happening to uh, communities uh, around there. And so I would, I would begin to connect with all of them. Is that helpful? Yeah, it is. Thank you so much. And it's really great to kind of remind myself and remind, I think a lot of people might need the reminders that like we have so many abilities to go help people, especially yeah. with all the knowledge we're learning. So that's right. Yeah, yes. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. And one thing I have found, you know, uh, Lydia, is we can focus on low cost solutions. You know, I think it's one of the things, one of the things I'm going to say somewhere today. And if I don't say it, I'm going to say it now. A lot of adaptation and resilience is going to be easier for wealthy people. 
because they will have the resources. They can move. People are talking about buy, buying islands and planet. I mean, like, you know, I think it's okay for, for rich people to be talking like that. But for, for a lot of people, these are not options. They are not going to move. They are where they are and they're going to have to deal with. So people like us who have the engineering mindset, we can say, hey, are there low-cost solutions? Can we, can, can we come up with low-cost effective solutions to some of these real hazards that people are going to have to deal with? Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, and let's keep going. Well, I mean, this is actually the natural segue into my next slide as it happens. So this shows that equity and justice issues are central to thinking about this problem. By the way, this applies to mitigation just as much as uh, adaptation, but it's particularly true for adaptation and resilience. So on the y-axis are emissions per capita for 180 nations across this planet. And on the, X, uh, I'm sorry, that's on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the relative vulnerability per capita. How vulnerable are these people and what, how much they have contributed? And you will see this tremendous concentration uh, on the left top of the curve where most countries had very little to do with emitting CO2 and are the most vulnerable. Uh, so these are the poor nations in the global south, basically, in, in Asia, in Africa, uh, in Latin America. They are most at risk and they didn't emit the CO2 and the GH, uh, greenhouse gases but they're going to be stuck with the impacts. And on the, on the right-hand side, again, the three big buckets that I mentioned, water availability and food production, health and well-being, and cities, settlements, and infrastructures. And that shows the risk matrix or, or impact matrix across Africa, Asia, Australia, uh, North America, and so on and so forth. So this kind of gives you a picture of where the impacts are going to be and what what they had to do with the emissions. And I think this, although I talk mainly at the level of nations, it's true within, the, within nations. So there are people, uh, typically it's been found that low-income people live in neighborhoods that are more vulnerable to flooding, more, more vulnerable to low, uh, poor, poor air. Certainly true in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, uh, extreme concentration of, of low-income people in areas with very bad air quality. So that this is the endemic to human, you know, the, how we have built our society, is that there is this inverse correlation between uh, guilt or blame uh, and, and uh, the, the suffering that it is, it is causing or it's going to cause. Okay. Now, uh, in the rest, I'm going to talk about what we know about adaptation and resilience. So first thing I want to point to is that UN produces something called the Adaptation Gap Report. Uh, and the latest one I have hyperlinked there in, uh, in 2022 on, on slide eight. And essentially it basically says that, yes, we are thinking of adaptation, but it's too little and too slow. We are not doing it fast enough. Next slide. And here I want to make a point that I think is particularly relevant to uh, your class, Stefan. Scaling strategies for climate change adaptation and resilience are in their infancy as against mitigation, okay? So let me just take one minute to unpack that claim. So when you think of mitigation, basically we are talking about decarbonization. We are saying, okay, how can we reduce fossil fuel use in everything that we do? Whether that's in our electricity production, that's in our uh, transportation system, that's in our industry and manufacturing, or cement, I mean, everywhere we are using fossil fuels or chemicals and fertilizers. So mitigation refers to just, let's not use oil, natural gas and coal, and let's go to more renewable sources, right? Scaling there is essentially by rollout of PV solar or wind or uh, uh, say hydrogen. So big plants or, or even distributed plants but mass manufacturing of PV solar, mass manufacture of wind turbines and their uh, implementation. So that's how we are going to scale solutions. And in fact, the, the, the biggest hope on climate change is coming from rapid reduction in the price of PV solar, price of wind, price of electric uh, batteries, right? That's what is giving us optimism that, hey, you know, maybe there's a path forward. Uh, we, we solve the electricity problem and make it all renewable or make it largely renewable and then make transport electric and okay, we got like, you know, 60, 50, 60% 60 of the problem, or roughly something like that. 
So scaling there is clear. It's through, through mass manufacturing, reduce your cost and implement millions of them. Adaptation and resilience, by contrast, is a much more local response. So you don't like build one and then make a million copies of adaptation, okay? Now, in some areas, this may be true, like, you know, say drought-resistant seeds. Well, if you can figure that out, I can imagine that some companies can just produce a lot of drought-resistant seed, and, and, and but a lot of other adaptations are going to be local. So how do you scale solutions so that billions of people who are at risk can benefit from this. We don't understand this. We don't understand this. And we need to be thinking about how, how we're going to scale. So it's OK for us to solve problems, say, in Santa Ana, California, or, or near uh, Detroit or Ypsilanti. But the, the world is very large. And how are we going to scale those solutions? So I want our, the students to be thinking about the scaling. Next slide. This just sort of uh, a very, very uh, nice conceptual way of thinking about uh, three elements, hazard. So hazard is like hurricane or wildfire or something like that, flooding. Then there is vulnerability. So then, you know, there could be sea level rise, but if I'm living in hills of California, you know, I'm, I'm protected. So I'm not vulnerable to it. But if I'm living in the low lying area, then I'm vulnerable. So that's the vulnerability. And, uh, and, and and then there is the exposure. So so these three things combine together to create the risk. So can I, I, I may have the hazard, I may or may not be exposed to it. And if I'm exposed to it, I may not be vulnerable to it. So if I'm living in a city with uh, extreme heat, I'm exposed to it, it's hazard, but I've got great air conditioning system. You know, I got great air purification system, so I'm not vulnerable to it. But if I'm a poor person, I'm vulnerable to it. So you have to think about all these three factors to understand the risk, and because the risk is going to vary from community to community, people to people, and so it's it's a it's a really good way to think about what's happening. Next slide, uh, slide eleven is a nice paper which I highly recommend reading. And it talks about effectiveness of adaptation. So not all adaptations are effective, and as engineers, we need to be thinking about. How 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 are adaptation of uh, uh, solutions are going to be effective in actually yielding the results? And I've taken a couple of uh, uh, things from this paper just to illustrate. So on slide eleven, on the left hand side are approaches to uh, adaptation, which are based on processes. Okay, so here you know, like one of the biggest things that need that is necessary is community based adaptation. That is what we cannot do. And I, this is to my, this is to the students. We cannot say, "Hey, you know, I have a solution. Let me give it to you." Wrong, wrong, wrong. The, the adaptation has to be done with the community. You have to go and situate yourself with the community, listen to them, and involve them in the solutions to the adaptation problem. It cannot come from high on high top and say, "Okay, this is the way to adapt." So these are uh, so there is actually uh, you know very nice fields in social science that that talk about community based uh, adaptation, ecosystem based adaptation, adaptive governance, and on the right hand side are more normative frames. These are goal oriented. Uh, these are more like outcome measures that we would like to achieve, like improved well being, enhanced resilience, reduced vulnerability. Avoided maladaptation. Some adaptations are actually negative. As an example, and maybe I'll come back to it a little later. One thing that you know is natural is okay, extreme heat. I'm going to give everybody an air conditioner. Okay. Just make you know, give a big donation, everybody gets well. I think this is okay. I mean, you know, I'm not going to say no to it, if, you know, but the end result of it is more emissions and more, more heat islands. And so that's a kind of maladaptation as compared to more sort of green spaces, urban green spaces, which is a whole different solution. And we will we'll talk about this a little. So let me not uh, let me not go there. But this is a very nice frame, and it leads to these eleven principles on slide twelve. I'm not going to read the principles. I'll leave that to you to read on at your leisure. Uh, but these are these uh, the paper proposes these principles that range from minimizing cost, maximizing benef benefit. Achievement of material, subjective, and relational well-being goals. It's not all material. It, it has a lot of emotional aspects are involved in uh, in adaptation. Reduce vulnerability, increase resilience, uh, be sustainable, 
uh, unintended negative consequences, uh, invest in ecosystem conservation, co-produce with communities. I spoke at length about co-production with communities, oriented towards transparency, accountability, and representation. One of the things that I have become aware of is a lot of distrust. So when you look at the impacted communities, they don't quite trust <laughs> the, the policymakers or those who are coming from somewhere else and saying, oh, this is how you want. I want to solve your problem. So we have to earn their trust. And I think this is, at least students should bear in mind that there is this whole trust issue. Uh, mm -hmm. So co-production and uh, being transparent and accountable, uh, oriented towards socially just and equitable processes and outcomes. And finally, which is like a big ask, but I think you are all young, so you should be thinking of this, uh, be a process that fundamentally changes human thinking and practices in the face of climate change, okay? So again, I'll, I'm gonna leave that to you to read. The next slide is an important slide because again, this is something that Stefan, in your course is something to think about, that there are certain kind of mitigation efforts that are synergistic with adaptation and some others that are not. And it's good to know uh, which ones are uh, synergistic and which ones are actually opposed to each other. So uh, I already spoke about, so on the right-hand side bottom, you will see adaptation actions that undermine, undermine mitigation efforts. So I gave you the example of air conditioning as an adaptation, but it is going to come at the cost of mitigation because it's going to increase uh, emissions. And then mitigation actions that increase uh, exposure. This is an interesting example, okay? So here they're saying, okay, so one approach to renewable is through hydropower, okay? And I think it's a, it's a great thing. Uh, and, and Michigan, I think, uh, certainly Quebec has a lot of hydropower. Um, but you are now more at risk to droughts and, and lack of water to run the hydropower. So if you get into a situation where you built a lot of hydropower and you're relying on that hydropower to power your grid and you get hit with either a hazard or a loss of that water, you are in big trouble. And maybe you need that water for something else like agriculture or uh, home use. So you have to be careful about the mitigation actions that aren't re that, that might increase your risk exposure. Uh, so, so there is this very complex dance between uh, mitigation and adaptation. And to the extent possible, uh, one should align the two. So there's a very, on slide 14, I have a uh, picture of the uh, title page of a very nice paper from OECD, which is Organization of, oh, sorry, uh, Organization of uh, Economic, Organ uh, for Economic Cooperation and Development. So they, they wrote a report in 2020, I think, on adaptation mitigation linkages uh, to strengthen the linkages so that we are doing the things in a synergistic way. And uh, just a couple of snapshots from there. So generally speaking, nature-based solutions tend to have a lot of co-benefits. So for example, protecting and restoring coastal habitats. This is slide 15. Uh, protecting and restoring upland forests, creating urban green spaces. All of these are using nature to, uh, to adapt, but they also give you a lot of additional benefits like you know, pollution or flooding. So, so I, this is really a very, very nice way to think about the solution strategies that we come up with uh, that uh, yield co-benefits. And then finally, adaptation mitigation language uh, linkages on page 16. And in four buckets of forestry, agriculture and land management, water management, and urban planning. And there are some examples of climate actions that you might take. And what are the mitigation benefits, what are the adaptation benefits, and are there any trade-offs? So kind of understanding at a system level uh, how you, what actions you might take in different areas and what sort of uh, linkages exist between mitigation and adaptation and resilience. Uh, is, is very nice and, and I would say uh, in the report that I, ha I have uh, shown you, you can get a lot more of that. Uh, let me finish by saying, I just gave you tip of the iceberg, okay? I just sort of painted a picture for you so you get an idea uh, of what, what these concepts are, what's in front of us. 
And I'll just close by saying that, you know, there are uh, incredible opportunities to make a positive difference here. Uh, and if you take really a broad open view of who you are and don't get tied down to a very sli siloed definition of who you are, uh, you can do a lot of good. You can do a lot of good and uh, derive a lot of satisfactions. And, and I wish everybody uh, the very, very best because you, this is going to be uh, much of your life's work. I'm, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry to say. I, I once said, you know, a, a, that oh, we, we depend on you for solving the problem. And I got a very strong pushback from young people like you who said, you created the problem and now you expect us to solve it. And it's not fair. And I think that's an, ex that's, that's an absolutely correct response. People like me, we are guilty of having created this problem. And so, I'm glad to be here with you, uh, sharing my thoughts, and uh, I'm hoping that what I said is somewhat useful to you. And I wish you wish you the very, very best. Stefan, back over to you. I'm done with the slides. Yeah, thank you very much, Ramon. This is a very fascinating discussion. I'm, I'm kind of curious about how you feel different countries are going to react uh, uh, differently to the challenges that you pose regarding adaptation and mitigation. And how do you think, uh, some countries can learn from best practices of other countries. And what's your, what's your, what are your views on so that? That's a great question. Uh, that's a great question, Stefan. It's at the heart of where we are in this journey. Uh, so just a few observations. I think Paris Agreement was really quite an amazing achievement when we got so many countries to agree. It was a very loose approach where everybody just got to say what they were going to do. But at a minimum, everybody came to the table and said they were part of the solution. So I think to me, that was a, was a nice beginning. Um, I think the global South is extremely angry about what is going on. Uh, I think by and large, they see, they see themselves as victims of this and they are poor. They don't have the resources. Uh, for them, raising their quality of life is the primary thing. Like they want to get jobs for their people and they want their people to live well. And how can you argue with it? I'm from India. And, you know, every Indian aspires to a better better standard of living. I, 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 and you know what? They're using coal, which is very bad. But can I fault them for it? I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel very queasy to say, Oh, you should be using, you know, solar. Of course, they are doing a lot of solar and wind as well, but they're also doing coal. And they say, well, we need everything. We can't, if we wait for everything to be based on solar and wind, we will wait for a long time and our kids are growing up. And, and so I think there is that feeling in Global South that this thing is not fair. And, uh, you know, there was this pledge uh, to generate like, I think, $90 billion or something uh, after, I think it was after Paris and we never, came close to fulfilling that. So, but they also know at the same time that they are vulnerable and that they are they are at risk. Uh, so that sort of is the global picture is simultaneously blaming the global north or the, the advanced de developed world for the causing the problem and not doing enough to solve it and not doing enough to help other people solve it. And it gets into, you know, uh, what happened with COVID, like IP issues. Uh, you know, we, we are creating technology, but we want people to pay for that technology uh, through, through intellectual property lies. So it's a, it's a very complex uh, scene. I'm most worried about poor people in developing countries. If you ask me, they are the, they are really blameless victims of what is going to happen. So if I'm Bangladesh, right? 250, I don't know, I don't remember the exact number. It's like 200 and some million people. They are a tremendous risk to sea level rise. And there will be mass migrations out of Bangladesh into India and in other countries. And I just, I mean, I, I just worry about that day when, when these kind of mass migrations happen from across the globe because climate conditions just make it impossible to live. So I don't know if that answered your question, but that's what, that's what doesn't, at the same time, I see the technological progress that we are making. So PV prices going down. PV is now the cheapest form of electricity anywhere, uh, of any sources. So PV is 
Uh, and wind is doing well, PV is doing well, although with this inflation, wind may go back up in terms of cost because material costs are increasing. Uh, battery costs are coming down, but again, you have material challenges there. Mark, please. Uh, Pramod, as yeah. an engineer, um, when we look at the, um, the benefits and the negatives of each solution that we come up with in terms of mitigating risk or uh, creating an adaptation, um, making sure that we're not vulnerable to uh, drought, for example, in, or anything really, but in, um, as an example in land management, yeah. when we need, when an a area of people needs cheap electricity, okay. they may use photovoltaic, but if the, they also need that land for food yeah. or they need it to mitigate mm -hmm. some other, uh, they need it for um, yeah. anything else, right? Like carbon sequestration for peatlands, if they're going to drain their peatlands in order to make room for agriculture and the photovoltaics. And each solution seems to have positives and negatives. And how would you weigh them against each yeah. other as an engineer? And come to I the think, you know, th there are two comments I want to make. One is that this is actually a real problem. It's happening uh, in many, many parts of the world where people were putting big solar farms, but then other people complaining that you just took away my land where I was growing food and making my livelihood. So this is, this is not hypothetical. This is very mm -hmm. real. It's happening. There are two things I will say. One is don't think that this is just an engineering problem. It is not. It really is a problem where you need to be working across sectors. So people from economics, from social sciences, from policy makers, to full and with the affected communities to really devise trade-offs and compensation. Uh, if, if you're going to impact somebody negatively, then are they being compensated fairly? So thinking, thinking in a much more holistic, broad, inclusive okay. framework, is the way to go. And it is not strictly an engineering problem. In fact, almost everything in climate change is not a strictly technology or engineering problem. Almost everything involves people, behavior, economics, uh, uh, policy. So, so that's how I would suggest you approach these questions, is become parts of teams who are thinking holistically about this stuff. Thank you. Can I follow up with a question then? Yeah. How do you approach uh, engineering education in the yeah. 21st century in view of climate change? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question, Stefan. And I think this course you're doing is like a great example of what needs to happen. So there are two answers. One is every student should get some education in climate change. Like there should, I think every engineering school should have more or less a required course in intro to climate change or one of some, you know, give them like one of five. So if I was a dean, I would be saying, okay, do we have such a requirement or very strong recommendation? Nobody wants requirements, you know, but very strong recommendation. And students are interested. So I don't think you really need to force people. I think people, right. people want to learn about this. So that would be one. It's like just general, what you're doing, general broad exposure to this topic uh, and our role in it. And second, really double down on our, uh, commitment to liberal education, which is every engineer gets a certain amount of exposure to humanities and uh, social sciences and arts, and we must double down on our commitment to that. I sometimes even say that this is beyond even social science and economics. It's really about us as human beings. So humanistic thinking, uh, you know, that, that uh, principle 11, which asks us to rethink how we live, uh, on this planet, I mean, that's not going to come just from sciences. It's going to come from, from deep inside our hearts. And I think humanities, literature, film, uh, they have tremendous power to move people and create new consensus. And I think we need to expose our students to, uh, to humanities and arts uh, and to literature that can be important to their future. Uh, so that's what I would I would recommend, Stefan. As, as education, we need to make sure that those two things are are taking place on our campuses. Thanks. Lydia, do you have a question? Yeah, I do have a question. 
So you kind of mentioned gaining trust and then in result, like influence in smaller communities. And so do you kind of have any recommendations, especially as someone that's from a very rural town in Michigan where a lot of uh, resistance would occur to most climate solutions? So do you have any recommendations when reaching out to groups of people and then specifically in the areas of creating and aiding in adaptation resilience efforts? Actually, uh, Lydia, that's a very, very deep question. And I want to answer it at at least two levels, if not more. One level is social polarization in our country, right? So Mm -hmm. left and right don't trust each other. uh, Okay. So how do you deal with that? Because even like are humans causing climate change, right? That like a good fraction of our country doesn't believe that we have anything to do with this and that it has all been happening all along and we are just making a big, big, uh, and it's, it would have happened anyway. And we, we our role, if at all, is, is uh, close to minor. Mm-hmm. There, it's actually a very, very fraught conversation because you can walk in with a lot of the assumptions we just made. You know, I showed you all those charts and they will not buy any of those charts, right? Yeah. Okay, so there, there are two things that I want you to know, and I can send you a lot of literature on this because I've studied this. If you ever ask a person to choose between their social group, where they belong, and some objective fact, 19 out of 100, they will pick the social group over the fact. You, so you never want to ask them to leave their social group. Never want to ask because you will fail. So what do you do? One great example comes from Miami. This is uh, probably 15 years ago. Miami experiences flooding today, okay? Not waiting for cli- uh, sea level rise. It's happening right now. So in Miami, what they found is, instead of talking about what's causing the flooding and it's the sea level rise, that's CO2 driven, they say, you know what? You and I both can agree there is flooding in our streets. Because we can see it with our own eyes. It's happening. What can we do together to solve this problem? So it takes you away from the debate about left and right, uh, political polarization into saying, it's a problem that you and I can both agree on. Can we work on a solution together? And once you find that common ground, then it's easier to do a lot of other things. So always try to find that common ground on which People who are different, who believe differently, can still agree that there is a problem uh, that we can both see and and agree to work on. So that's that's been successful. There's a lot of theory behind what I just finished telling you uh, as to how how people react to climate change education. Uh, So I would say you begin there. You begin to you begin with a common ground, a common understanding of the issue you are trying to to work with them on and then adapt adapt to your language adapt your conceptual thinking and framing of solutions so that they can see that it's good for them Mm -hmm. that's the ticket it's a lot of work it's a lot of work as compared to what we are used to which is build a gizmo and sell million copies of it right that's what we are good at Detroit, you know, they make millions of cars and sell it to anybody who wants to buy it. We 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 mastered the art of mass production, especially in Michigan. Uh, but it, this is a different game, you know. We are in a different game, uh, especially with adaptation and resilience with community. The good thing is, uh, Lydia, there is a lot of knowledge on this and how to do it right and how to how to do it wrong and not uh, and how we can avoid doing wrong. One thing that scientists and engineers invariably get wrong is, oh, they they just don't understand. If I only tell them, they'll get it. It doesn't work that way. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. Anytime you go with an attitude that I know and you don't know, you already lost the game. So you go with a much more empathetic, almost like the design thinking. I don't know if you heard about, about design thinking approach, but you know, you're going with like a design thinking approach where it's empathetic listening and then framing. The, the issue and framing then the solution. It's a much more likely path to success. I, I hope that was responsive to your question. And if you're interested, just email me and I'll send you some papers. That will be, that will blow your mind. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really nice, especially kind of as like 
a follow-up and second part to what you were recently discussing with, you know, helping communities and reaching yeah. out. So yeah. kind of more segue into that. So that was very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Pramod. I think uh, at this point, unless there's further questions from Mark and Lydia, we probably are ready to, to conclude here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to uh, thank you so much, Pramod, for uh, participating and uh, preparing all these slides for us and then uh, all the uh, very sound advice that you've given to our students in the class. And uh, I, um, uh, on behalf of everyone, I thank you again for your time. and. Uh, Hope to uh, see you back on campus in Michigan at some point in the near future. Thank you so much, Pramo. Well, thank you. Thank you, Stefan, for inviting me. I I put my email in the last slide so people can write to me anytime, and I generally respond very quickly. Uh, so if you have any further questions or you want to dig deeper into one thing or another, just let me know, and I'll be happy to help. Thanks a lot. Thank you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.